Thank you. Um, so, thank you for coming along and listening to my talk. Uh, this is a topic I'm quite um, passionate about. It's also great to be given a talk in person for the first time in just over two years. Um, hopefully, we'll see more of this thing happen um, later in the year as well. More in person on that is great. Um, so, I'm going to be worried about giving uh, a whole side of about myself. I'll just give a quick thing. Um, so, my name is Sean. I involved in application security, so this is why I have such a vested interest in supply chains, or more supply chains from the software side of things, um, and I do a lot of my personal research. Um, so, I'm going to start off with two questions, and don't answer them now, I'll come to them at the end, but just keep on thinking about it in the back of your mind as we go through this presentation. Now, the first question is, would you allow any sort of random stranger off the street to commit code to your code repository? I think I know the answer for this, but just keep that in mind. Um, and then the second one, if you were an attacker, would you take the easy route into the hard route? Ooh. So, I think one of the important things is we need to take a step back and see how things have changed over the years, especially when it comes to development software and including uh, third party software in there. So, when I first started off in my career, I started off um, at a time where third party software wasn't really that common. Most often, or you would develop things from the ground up. So companies would go off, pull their own internal libraries, and you'd probably be asked the question, why would you want to use someone else's stuff? Why do you not develop it internally? From a security point of view, this is great. Um, you have better control and visibility into the libraries. From a code reusability point of view, it's not so great. I mean, you could reinvent the wheel, there's a lot of maintenance around these packages, so if there's any sort of new functionality or updates that needs to be done, you have to have vested time and um, resources doing that. So if you shift towards to what, how we approach it today, it's completely changed. So I think of most applications as kind of glue. You take all these different libraries and frameworks and you code them together to form the functions and features that you want. And this is fantastic from a business point of view. What it means is, we can get things out faster and quicker and with less effort. From a security point of view though, it does introduce some element of risk. You're taking code, essentially, from outside your organization and including it into your uh, software. And this is where the risk starts growing, and it's starting to become more of an issue today. And I'll go through the uh, slides later on. So what I have here is a snapshot from a company called Sonatype. Sonatype are kind of the de facto um, name in uh, dependencies and third-party libraries. And every year they produce this report called, uh, I forgot to remember the name of it, the State of the Software Supply Chain. So they do that on a daily basis. And what this shows is just the number of downloads in terms of an increase. So this was from last year's report, 2021, um, comparing it to the year before, so 2020. I'm really interested to see what this year's report is going to look like, but you can see those numbers there are quite significant. And that is the increase in the number of downloads of the different languages. So you're looking towards something like Java, which is about 71%, um, JavaScript 50%, Python 92%, so on and so forth. And those were already a high number, and they just keep on growing rapidly. And this kind of forms into that whole point of our question about the way we change our development strategy. And that's great, I mean, we get things up a lot quicker. So, this does introduce the element of risk, as I mentioned. Um, because you have a third party code, this means attackers can start leveraging this to attack organizations or kind of use a touch, a shotgun type approach where they can try to target many organizations. 
And the way they do that is by different methods. So these are not all the methods that they could use, but some of the methods that they could use to try to target these libraries and target organizations. So at the top is a attack type called dependency confusion. This is quite a relatively new attack type. It was brought kind of conceptualized last year. This leverages the way package managers work. Um, with package managers, you typically have a public facing repository. So in the likes of Java world, you've got a maiden, you've got a maiden a repository called Maven Central. Um, in Python world, you have PyPy. Um, in JavaScript world, you've got FPM, so on and so forth. And organizations have their own internal public repositories. And these are repositories that aren't um, publicly facing, or they shouldn't be, they're only private, they're only accessible to that organization. And this is where organizations would place their own internal packages on these repositories. So any sort of software that they're developing, including um, web applications that are probably not nasty and can be deployed by that. So, CRCD uh, way of doing things. Now, dependency confusion takes these two repositories and it leverages the fact that by default, most package managers will attempt to download the package from the public repository first before it attempts any concrete private repository. So, what an attacker could do is create the same package structure, name, and version number, and, and then they could post it in this public repository. So when an organization comes to the goal and they pick the right version, or download the attacker's package versus the external one. And this um, attack type has actually grown quite significantly. Um, I forgot the exact numbers, it is in that sort of type of course, but it is becoming a big issue. In fact, it's now one of the most common types of attacks on software dependencies. Other examples. Of entire attacks are malicious packages. So, this is where an attacker would actually purposely create a package with the vulnerability of that for um, And then compromise packages. So, this is quite similar to the malicious packages, but this is where it's a legitimate package, but the attacker compromises that account somehow. So, they could compromise the author's account or compromise the build structure that builds and deploys that package. And then the last one is vulnerable packages. So these again are legitimate packages, but they have some sort of vulnerability in it, whereby the attack will then go and exploit. And coming towards the title of this talk is it's becoming a growing risk. So I've personally seen this start into ramp up. Um, I've started giving this talk along these lines back in 2019. Uh, which seems quite some time ago. COVID is like time warped us somehow. But um, I started giving this talk in 2019, and I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that there's a glaring hole, uh, an easy goal for attackers, and I couldn't figure out why we were in that region. Fast forward to today, we're starting to see that happen pretty significantly. I just saw a tweet yesterday. From trusted set, or something like two hundred and eighty percent increase in targeted attacks on uh, supply chains, and he has a sort of a rough scale from the end of twenty, uh, end of actually sorry twenty twenty, um, all the way through to twenty twenty two. So he started off with the likes of solar winds, which I'm sure many of you uh, realised. Or heard about that incident so that happened in December 2022, um, and then the latest one actually happened this week. And I'll actually show hopefully a live demo of that. So one of the things I like doing whenever I give these talks is to give some real world examples. So it's always good saying, "Hey, this may be an issue, or this could probably happen, or whatever." This isn't, this could happen, this has happened. Um, and trying to highlight some cases where it has happened. So probably one of the most targeted repositories at the moment is NPM. 
So no package manager appointments. Um, so this is basically where JavaScript repositories. And there have been numerous cases over the last few weeks and months where attackers have leveraged the um, public nature of it and started hosting their own malicious packages. So they've done things from typo squatting. Now typo squatting is where attacker would try and create a package with a very similar name or uh, notion to the package they're targeting. So an example was um, Discord with Robobox, there were some MPM uh, packages that you could find on the Discord server. The attack is created very similar sounding sound names. Um, like, I forgot, I think it was Robobox as proxy was one of the examples, and so on and so forth. So if you come in to try and develop this, which package is a legitimate package? That's probably one of the problems that we face today. There's no way of saying, well, this is legitimate, or well, this is probably not. Um, and then I think I forgot the exact article, but also recently, um, Spring Forget, they were um, doing research and they found a whole bunch of other malicious packages on NPM. Now, granted, I actually didn't know this until recently, NPM is actually owned by GitHub, and now I'm doing a pretty good job of finding with this, but it's basically a losing battle. Because of its open nature, most uh, attackers can just simply go push out the malicious packages. And part of the problem is, you've got to be careful how I phrase it. Um, when people are using packages for uh, software, they often come to the incorrect conclusion that, okay, it's an official repository, so therefore everything can be trusted on there. And thankfully, by and large, most packages are legitimate, and unfortunately, there are some that aren't. And this example we have, thankfully, wasn't a legitimate or malicious package, but it was a package that did absolutely nothing nonetheless. It had three files in it. If you try to use this package, it would accomplish nothing. Zero. No. Um, and I don't know why the author created this package. Maybe they were going to do something with it later. I don't know. Um, it's, there was only one version, um, and it eventually got taken over by the official NPM uh, accounts. This package name was Dash, that was the name, just Dash. Um, again, I think they're assuming that people will start things when they're dropping commands. What was worrying and staggering about this is if you have a look at those graphs, the, the first point in the graph is when a package was released, or uh, sorry, when I could do snapshots, so with npm repository, npm downloads, and how many dependents, so how many other packages use this as a dependency. And that first snapshot was taken in 19 of August in 2021. Sorry, that's the top of it. Um, and all the way through to just a few weeks ago. And you can see the significant increase. So we're talking about thousands of weekly downloads, and there was about 90, 84, I think, dependent. So uh, uh, 84 other packages dependent on has this package as a dependency. And this package does nothing. So that to me points to the fact where people are just downloading stuff without actually validating it. Another example, thankfully this one didn't go anywhere, but it could have ended up really bad. PHP. I'm sure we all know or have heard of what PHP is. You have really common things such as WordPress um, running on PHP. <laughs> And what the attackers did is they managed to do a malicious code commit to the official PHP repository. If that got out, you can imagine the impact that that would have had. But thankfully, that code commit was caught before it ever got out anyway. And PHP subsequently changed their whole way they they now do the code. I think they moved repositories to GitHub at that. But that just shows you the potential of this. If they, if the attacker managed to successfully put a backdoor in there, that would have compromised thousands, if not tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of servers, potentially. Log4j. 
this one came over last year. I remember it fondly because I was traveling on that day. I was trying to multitask as best I could do while traveling from Bristol. Uh, this one, I have mixed reactions about this because on the one hand it is pretty significant. So Java is very really widely used, Log4j is the kind of de facto logging framework. So it is used extensively across multiple applications in Java. So you're talking about web apps, desktop apps, um, and so the breadth of this was pretty significant. The fact that we could also uh, export it with relative ease, um, when I say relative ease, it very much depended. So if there was a, an internally developed web application, it would be pretty difficult because you, you, everything you're doing is blah. Whereas if you have open source, you can actually then see things, see the code and all that. Nonetheless, it was pretty significant. And it allowed for one tactic to, to be able to do remote code execution. The worrying thing about this is the aftermath. So a lot of these tags are great, the hubs there, but then you stand back and look at it a few weeks, months later. How many of you think, just as a show of hands, uh, or an uh, estimate, how many of you think that uh, organizations are still done about the vulnerable versions of Alpha J? Alright, so let's start throwing out some numbers. One million? How many do you think it's above one million? One person. One person. Four million what? Uh, downloads of the vulnerable version of the day. Um, since the December the 10th when it came out. Yeah, sorry, not weekly downloads, but like probably four days. About 10 million? Hundred million? Not quite that much. One billion. <laughs> <laughs> so since December the tenth, there's been thirty just a say around about like, probably now close to thirty-seven and a half million downloads of a vulnerable version of Log4j. And that accounts for forty-six percent of all downloads of Log4j. And the thing at the time that really got me wound up is the way we're approaching this, and I'll come to this a little bit later. Ironically, another job in my hobby, that's just right. And this one here is pretty significant. Um, the reason why I picked this, and I was debating whether I should still talk about this, this happened in 2017. Organization called Equifax. Which I'm sure most of us have heard about, and it's been subsequent. I've been some time since. That vulnerability cost that company one and a half billion dollars. But more importantly for me is that vulnerability should have made people aware of the things they needed to do back in 2017. So the really frustrating thing for me um, when Log4j is when Log4j came out. People should have already been prepared based off this vulnerability. We have people going around not knowing whether we're using log 4 j But this vulnerability here with Patch Stretch should have got people thinking about this. And then this week, we find a similar situation. Oh my gosh, another job that I'll get some. We have quite a job here, apologies. Um, and hopefully, with this, I'll be able to show you a uh, demo and talk it through a bit. But again, another vulnerability has come out. Not aware of any attacks yet, but there is a working proof of concept. So, we have these problems. What are we going to do about it? So, this was one of the really frustrating things for me with the likes of Log4j when it came out. When it came out, we saw many people jumping on it, and that was great. But in my view, we're approaching it wrong. So by that I mean people trying to create standalone scanners, go, hey, we're gonna scan your network, we're gonna scan all the file on your system, all that. That's great for something that you buy or use open source. Fantastic. But any kind of software that you develop, 
That's not sustainable. And it's a really rudimentary way of doing it. There are ways that are going to be much better. And as I said, back in 2017, that should have been a long way off for you to start doing this stuff. Which is why I went on for Jake and I and I was so frustrated. But as we see, it's still a problem. We're still trying to solve the same problem using old methods. So the way we should be doing these things is using something called SCA, the Software Composition Analysis. And what this does is actually scans the code, generates what's termed a software bill of material, an SCOM, that then can be used to manage your dependencies in your software. This S1 can also be scanned by the SCA to determine which packages are vulnerable. So in the case of Log4j, if you use appropriate uh, SCA, you can say, plug in, hey, where am I using this specific version of this package? All these uh, projects, great, now I know exactly where I need to go and update those libraries, can't update those libraries, I know where, where I need to go. Focus uh, remediation, so RAS, that kind of thing. You're not dealing with this by me. And this is what organizations should have been doing back in 20, from 2017 onwards. Not throwing network scanners and file scanners and that kind of thing. This is gold. This is how you can help solve this problem. So, what are the tools that does a really fantastic job? I don't often recommend tools, I try to keep as many tools as possible, but I'll make an exception for this tool. This is something I've seen first time and the benefit of. It's a tool called Ours Dependency Track, and I'll show you an example of that shortly. Um, in our Ours project, it's entirely free. The, this is a tool that you could probably pay a few hundred to thousand dollars or thousands of dollars to use, but it's free now. Use it. There's like no reason why or excuse you should be using something like this. And make sure that you integrate this in your bolt cycle. So it's continuously doing, it's scanning, reporting, you're continuously triaging the results. It's not a single point in time when this vulnerability comes up. You need to make sure you stay on top of this. This is something I've seen done generally very. Um, Already in the past, where versions will be used at that specific point in time and then they won't be updated afterwards. It's a continuous process. You need to make sure that you stay on top of it. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you some examples. So this here is a tool called Dependency Track, as I So I have some projects in here. You can see it's got nice dashboards and all of that kind of thing. But the really cool stuff about this is is you can go to your projects and now you can start seeing a snapshot of where your different vulnerabilities are. So if I can I can see the first two is the spring uh, spring demo and Jenkins. But I don't have any vulnerabilities. I can actually dive into that. You can actually see the components used. So you can now start seeing where what, what makes up this specific version uh, or specific project, and you can even see when packages are out of date, whether it's last or that kind of But you're probably more interested in the vulnerabilities. So you can actually put it in here. And you can go with the vulnerabilities. Now you can start seeing a snapshot of the different vulnerabilities and the severity of them. So now this makes triaging the update.
rate of prioritizing that text even better. So you can start determining from the top critical, high, maybe medium, maybe low, and on you go. The other also really important thing is you can, with this tool, come into the components view <coughs> and then start searching for different components across all your projects. So, say for instance, there's no MVD entry point like there was with uh, Spring, which is why you'll see in that, in that Spring demo, which I took this week, it should be showing vulnerabilities because that is actually vulnerable. But because there's no entry yet in the vulnerability databases, so MVD, um, some other ones that can call that one, um, you can't see that all time, but you know it's vulnerability. You can come into the component section, search for the, the components, and see where it's been used, and then deal with it appropriately. And as I mentioned, one of the other bits of this was the continuous advance. So this tool has a plugin that allows you to integrate with Jenkins and you can actually start running this as part of your little cycle. So as you can see on the right hand side, there's a nice graph so you can actually see that all time once you go project, you see the build, you see how many vulnerabilities you have and all of that. And you can even go further. So what you can actually do Bottom is you can have these kind of release gates, uh, what they call their risk thresholds. So you can actually cause the bubble to fail if it has a certain number of critical vulnerabilities or a certain number of high. You, know, you can set the threshold and whether they're new or existing. So you can now suddenly start being reactive rather than, I'm um, sorry, being proactive rather than being reactive. So you can start really tackling this and do it in a continuous manner. So those are the tools that you can use. Now, as I mentioned, maybe a bit more exciting is the spring vulnerability. So the spring vulnerability came out this week, two days ago, in fact, on Wednesday. Um, and there is So I'm sorry I'm just read about um, So this is a Spring web application that's using a vulnerable version of um, Spring. Nothing really exciting on the app itself. So if you go there, you just return to simple page. This is a proof of concept, so bear with me. Um, <coughs> the real something is probably lower level and then the actual exploit itself. So, what we have here is some code that's used to run this um, proof of concept. Um, this is a vulnerability in the Spring MVC model view container. It's a pattern that's used by many web applications in order to represent business data, logic, data, and then representing that as a view to the user. The, the interesting bit for the Proof of concept is not really in the model, so you can see the model here. It's not important for this vulnerability, it's just some 
really basic um, uh, string, which is not exciting. As well as the view, it's just the view could really be anything. The, the vulnerability is not like the controller where you have a line. This is basically a way of tying the model to your business logic. And we allocated this controller as a resource for the pod. And this is where the magic happens when it runs this exploit. So this is part of um, When this vulnerability came out, there was a bit of confusion around it. Um, it was back for me to get it working. Um, there were some difficulties between the exploit script itself, there was missing some details in it, but eventually we picked it up. Fixed and people managed to get it working. What this does is actually exploit the vulnerability in Spring, dumps a JSP file on the Tomcat server. So this vulnerability is only vulnerable if you're running Spring, uh, sorry, uh, way back on Apache Tomcat and JDK 9 and above. And it does this JSP, basically whatever you can, whatever you want to do in that JSP. So in this case, the proof concept includes Java code to execute commands. And therefore you get the command invention on your box. Um, it's all there, so it's on my GitHub repository if you're interested to give it a shout, and we can, um, I can give it the details of that. Um, so the next thing we need to do <coughs> Is actually um, Can everyone see this? Or is it just more? Zoom in. Zoom in. I'm just trying to see how I zoom in. Anyone know how you zoom in on the Mac? Oh, uh, uh, there we go. Thank you. There we go. All right, that good? Cool. Um, so what I'm going to do now is run my exploits. So this is going to send off the request to the server with the command kuyama. And if it's successful, we should get the user that is running this. Fingers crossed. There we go, yeah, yeah, it worked. Um, so, we've got the kuyama running as the root. So, I can do, uh, I get the root. Let's see. Run this now. I think we get password file. Sorry, I'll tell that to my phone, so it's probably a bit slow. Oh, there we go, yeah. Um, so that is full remote code execution. Um, now, whether this can happen with uh, out authentication, I don't know. Um, just my meaning on that, I think it could possibly be so. Um, it uses uh, a combination of the header and the composed bodies and that. So, possible that you could actually execute this without authentication. But I can't confirm that. As you can see, it's pretty significant. And this was just one last week. So, the point is, there's all these vulnerabilities out there in libraries um, and it's becoming more and more of a thing. So, Coming back to those first two questions asked in the beginning. Would you allow someone to run some random stranger off the street to run uh, code on your repository? You are, okay, cool. Yeah, the, the point I'm making is I'm talking about a private repository. 
<laughs> Would you? Yes or no? No? Yeah. So, why are we then just putting stuff from a repository where we don't even know the person, we've never seen them? There's no difference, right? We are literally just plotting code from the internet off the, without any validation. Go and look at that node, gosh, that's a good example. No validation in that. So, why are just going to be forward to be downloading it? Or hopefully not. Um, so, this is why we have to be wary. And I'm not saying we shouldn't trust people. We should say we should buy and hide most people are doing a good job. We just need to verify that whole trust with verify. So, libraries that you are using in your um, software, try and do at least a rough review of it. And then, from an attacker point of view, why would you want to spend hours and a whole bunch of effort trying to get through to an organization when you can do something like create a malicious package and then get it neatly inserted into an organization or many organizations with relatively little effort? And you're going to get straight away a much better escalated privilege with low effort. So it's going to be run in a production environment, possibly with privileged access to customer data. Now, obviously, depending on the application you target, but from an attacker point of view, it's a great way to, to invest and exploit the victims. The other problem is, there's just, because of that wealth or that uh, volume, and you're talking about if you need to review every source line, uh, sorry, every line of code, you're talking about thousands of lines, possibly per um, dependency, and then the dependencies have low end dependencies and it just gets messed. So trying to manually review every line of code is just not feasible. So you've got this kind of needle in the haystack type of thing. Try to find that snippet of code that's hiding in a massive wealth of code. It's going to be really difficult. So, just ending off, I think the closing thing that I would, would like to say is while it's going to be difficult to tackle this problem, and there's different things out there, such as Google and Salsa, and that, that are trying to look at tackling this problem, we have to start off somewhere. And if going back to the way we approach things like Log4J, we're not even starting off there, we're still doing the whole thing. So my view is, if we can just start looking at using things like SEAs, that's a good starting point. That's going to put us in a good position to then move forward and have anything else that comes up. So if we start validating um, uh, authors and different dependencies and that kind of thing. So we just need to start with somewhere. We can do that. There's two of them. It's not cost prohibitive. We shouldn't be doing that. So thank you. Um, it's been great to give this talk to you all and finally talk to people's faces rather than some webcam. Um, this has been fantastic. And yeah, any questions? Yeah. Majority of organizations have got zero control over their code. So, how are they going to do this if it's all compiled? Uh, what do you mean, zero control over their code? Windows, VMware, yeah. applications, as they're called. So, that I agree is more of the supply chain issue rather than the software supply chain. By software supply chain, I mean those organizations that are using uh, dependencies and frameworks for their own code. So, in terms of software supply chain, yes, you're going to have to rely on a vendor. This is where you can start holding vendors to account. So, things like when Spring or Log4J comes up, you start posing those questions to those vendors. What are you doing about this? How are you protecting me? Um, and then also we have things like security advisors from those vendors.
is a really good place. And this shouldn't start. If there are factor buyers, they should, or even if there aren't factor buyers, they should have some run up informing their users of how they're reacting to it and what their users need to do. Uh, so, at what point is it the package manager's responsibility um, as a Google container repository to, to step in uh, when a product or code is published? So, I know NPM is quite good and proactive, but completely not using that, but a lot of the code is using that. We see this in the open bar downloads. Yeah, so I think. The trouble is the vulnerable versions of the data packages, right? So NPM, I could be wrong, but as far as I know, they don't remove vulnerable versions from their repositories. If they did, they'd probably break a whole bunch of things. Malicious packages, there's obviously a very valid reason for removing it. This is why organizations need to invest in their own repositories so they can have control. Um, there are tools like Sonatar Firewall, we can start setting up policies. Um, I use it in one organization, it's really great. We can start setting up policies where you can't even call down those vulnerable versions. But this also leads on to another important thing that many people forget is with a lot of these package managers, a lot of the dependencies are cached. So it's all very right, we have these malicious packages and stuff like NPM. Yeah, let's pull them to your private repository. That's not going to go away until you physically remove that. Or, yeah, you remove it from that repository. Uh, and then having things like SCAs that you're constantly monitoring. So, this is, you could argue that the repository uh, managers could do uh, more to help, but um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. But organizations really need to take control of this. So I was curious more uh, uh, regarding the uh, kind of distribution stuff that I mentioned before that a lot of package managers do crowd the public version before the private version. No, so what that would do is say you have a package called XYZ version A. The dependency manager will go into the public repository first, you yeah. try down and from there, it's not better than not have the private repository. So attackers would then go and create dependency into a bird, but a name public repository. Cool. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say as well. But um, and then uh, I, I, I was curious to know if you send a public uh Google example, like because I assume that if that's really the case, then there was a leak of how that package looks like in the private repository, so it's sort of can in person and then in yeah. the world, right? So do we know if the case at this point we know that that is how it happens? Publicly, I don't know. Um, so I don't have, unfortunately, in the report, I wish they did, they would include some examples, but they don't. They just say, yeah, it's the, the, the biggest. So I totally get what you're saying, especially if it's an internal uh, package. You have to kind of create it exactly the same, otherwise you've got the long bars. Um, I think sometimes organizations build their own internal packages as well. I know Google do this um, themselves. They, they don't actually download packages. So they're obviously going to have some firewall or I don't know. Um, where they build it internally. So that could maybe be a way to get access to the source code because it's open source. I, but unfortunately, I don't know. I just know that some of the time in the report says the largest um, attack company is probably. Cool. All right, well, thanks everyone.